Okay, as we're, uh, as we're moving in here, there are handouts uh, that, that uh, kind of detail some of the hands-on stuff we're doing. There's two pages. Somehow, it was supposed to be double-sided, but now you need two, two pages. <laughs> I can talk louder. I got the microphone. Um, uh, so grab those if you didn't get them on the way in. Um, I think we're going to start in just a second. Um, because our time has already begun. Okay. So, uh, welcome to the Fat Star Conference. Welcome to our uh, tutorial. My name is Robin Burke. I am a professor at the University of Colorado. Um, and uh, I am presenting this with my colleague uh, Masood, who's over there in the check shirt. Wave your hand. Yeah. Um, and um, my uh, student, Nassim Sombali, uh, also the University of Colorado. Um, thanks to the immigration policies of the United States of America, she cannot leave um, and so could not come to this conference. And uh, so I'm, I, 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 I feel bad about that. There's nothing I can do about it, but she did an enormous amount to make this uh, possible. Um, and so, uh, so my thanks to her, even though she wasn't able to be here. <coughs> so uh, this is a hands-on tutorial, as, uh, as we uh, advertised. And that means that if you did bring your laptop, if you are interested in uh, working along with the experiments that we're doing, oh, cool. Um, we have had all kinds of fun things happen with this projector today. Um, but um, some things I can wave my hands about, but other things uh, we really, really want to see up there. Um, and, and there's a couple things that I have to talk to you about um, before any of the hands-on stuff will make sense. So there's going to be some prefatory things here before we get to the hands-on part. Um, during that time, you can be installing the software that you're going to need. Um, and the handout will give you uh, directions about what that is and how to do that. We will um, allocate some time during the tutorial for um, Nicole over here, the volunteer, and also Jess, who's another one of my students from the University of Colorado. They uh, each have uh, been through boot camp of installing and using the software, so they should be able to help you uh, if you have any difficulties. Uh, so in terms of the preparatory material, um, we have to talk a little bit about what it means to have fairness in recommender systems um, and how that uh, fits into what you might already know about fairness in machine learning because there are some important uh, differences. And then, um, and then we're going to talk about some of the technical underpinnings of what it is that we're doing. And hopefully, uh, if we have time before the break, we'll get to the point where uh, we can actually Make sure everybody's got that wants to has the software installed, and that you can run that first example and uh, and see the tool at work. Um, so, and then we will have a break. We'll have a half hour break from 2:30 to 3, and then the second half of the tutorial we'll actually start using some of the fairness aware aspects of Librec Auto. We'll talk about metrics for assessing the fairness of recommendations. We'll talk about some of the algorithms. Oh, and I left out the third thing. That's OK. Um, we'll talk about some of the algorithms that exist for trying to enhance the fairness of recommendations. And in particular, we'll talk about, at the end, uh, that's not here. Do I have a pointer? I do. How about that? Um, there's one bullet point that's not there about uh, re-ranking algorithms, which is a whole class of, of uh, fairness-enhancing um, techniques. And then uh, along the way, we will look at some examples of how to use this tool. And um, if you're racing ahead because uh, you're like that, um, then there's actually some optional extra stuff that you can try, and that's detailed in the handout. If you didn't get a handout, are we out? We're almost out. Yeah, yeah. OK. So uh, you may need to, to peer over the shoulder of the person next to you uh, or share the handouts if. Uh, if there weren't enough of them. It's, a two, it's two pages, just so you are aware. Yeah.
two pages. It's two pages. Did you get both pages? Because <laughs> one page by itself is not going to help you that much. <laughs> All right. So a little bit about us. Uh, as I said, I'm from the University of uh, Colorado. Um, Masood is a PhD student at uh, TU Eindhoven, and uh, as I said, uh, Nicole. I mean, um, Nassim is is also a PhD student. There have been numerous other contributors to this project. Um, uh, some undergraduates at the University of Colorado and some undergraduates at uh, DePaul University um, as well. <coughs> I would also like to thank um, uh, some folks that, that uh, have been uh, closely involved with this conference, Michael Ekstrand, Fernando Diaz. Um, the three of us put together a tutorial at, um, it was not a hands-on tutorial, but a tutorial at uh, the Rexis conference. It was also offered at SIGIR in 2019, uh, Fairness and Discrimination in Recommendation and Retrieval. Some of this information is drawn from that, and I wanted to make sure to acknowledge uh, their contributions to that. Um, so it's great that you all are here. I had this vision of like five people at the front of the room, so, so this is great. Um, and in particular, if you want to use this software, if you want to experiment with, with fairness and recommendation, we would love to talk to you. If you want your algorithm in here so we can test it, that's great. Um, if you have some data sets, you know, data is the new oil, as we know. So, um, so we're interested in that to fuel all of our research. So uh, by all means, uh, talk to us. And uh, you can find us at um, that recommender systems lab. And uh, so it's that Rexus lab, uh, dot net. Uh, And if you didn't find it already, if you go there under projects, um, there's something for this tutorial, and that page actually has links to the slides and to that handout, so you can get it that way virtually if you don't have a real paper copy. <coughs> uh, these are some important references. I'll point to other things as we go along. Um, this is for Librex, um, the sort of underlying technology, and then these are two papers about Librex Auto that have been published in the last couple of years. Other stuff you'll see at the bottom of the slides. <coughs> so, and I put this slide up here because if you want to uh, do the hands-on portion, you will need um, you will need Java, Python, uh, you'll need Git to grab the uh, the, the, the um, tutorial materials, and you'll need a text editor to do some manipulation there. Uh, last time we tried it, this sequence worked. That's the same information that's in the handout. So I'm going to click on that, and it's going to disappear, but uh, you'll be able to find it either on the handout or when we get around to it. This is the important part, because it can take a while if you haven't installed these things already. Okay. <coughs> Uh, the conference organizers have set up an online forum for questions. It's that. Um, uh, so, and I understand that it's different in the next session. Is that right? Oh, it will be the same. Okay. So, um, I don't know how to use it. I've never used it before. But um, if you have questions, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions at any time. Just raise your hand. But um, if you'd rather enter them into that uh, uh, forum you can, and then uh, Nicole will stop me and say, hey, we have a question. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about fairness in recommendation. What does that mean? And first, we want to talk a little bit about the what, what recommendation is and how it works. So um, I think as most people in this audience would understand, a lot of our experience of the online world is mediated by personalized recommender systems. So um, if you subscribe to Spotify, if you have, if you look at your Facebook feed ever, if you go to Google News, if you um, look at uh, product recommendations on, on uh, e-commerce sites like Amazon, for example, you're looking at recommendations. You're looking at systems that are interfacing between you and a catalog of items or information and providing a personalized view of that information to you. So <clears throat> we can think about this operation 
Um, there's something we want to do with the items to develop, you know, uh, representations of what they are, whether they're news stories, uh, shoes, musical artists, whatever it is. There's a similar thing we may want to do to the users to understand, okay, what is this user like? How is this user like other users that are in the system? Um, and those, that information comes together to provide retrieval or recommendation and some sort of rendering, like do I see a list? How are those recommendations presented to you? Um, in what kind of interface? And then uh, that, of course, feeds back into understanding the user uh, because I see you clicked on this item, not on that item, you bought this, you didn't buy that, you, uh, you had never listened to this artist before and now you listen to them every day. Okay, so I'm learning something as, uh, as, as I go on. And then part of that is, um, all that information can then be stored, and then it's possible to, um, to look at uh, different recommendation algorithms and evaluate them retrospectively. How well would they have done on this data if they were trying to provide recommendations to a particular set of users over a particular set of items? Okay, so <clears throat> some key things that make this different uh, from what you might have seen in thinking about fairness in machine learning. In fairness in machine learning, we are typically concerned about a classification task. Classic example would be something like, uh, who gets a loan, right? So I have this information about, uh, about an individual, and then I'm going to make some yes or no decision. Am I going to give them credit or not? Okay, so that's a classic example in which you know, fairness would certainly apply. But there are some interesting things about those sorts of cases. Um, <coughs> this is an individual decision, and every individual is independent from all the others, generally. I mean, maybe your bank only has so much money to lend, and so if I give it to you, I don't give it to somebody else. Usually that doesn't enter in to those uh, kinds of systems. And it's a one-shot process. So um, I, you know, I have a set of um, choices. I make my decisions about the credit worthy or, worthy or non-credit worthiness, and then we're done. <coughs> the other thing that's very important as a distinction is this issue of who does the process serve. So generally in a classification setting like the one that I described, we think of the criterion as being relatively objective. So you know, um, it shouldn't matter who the loan officer is, which loans get recommended, or it shouldn't matter um, who the, you know, the HR person is, the, you know, the best CVEs should be the ones that uh, are forwarded for the job. Um, and there are some exceptions um, to those, but generally that's the kind of classical <coughs> machine learning setting where people have studied fairness. And so recommendation is really quite different. In spite of the fact that it is a machine learning, it, it's, it's a machine learning kind of system, um, and it's making these automated decisions, they're really quite different. So one issue is that typically a recommender system is producing a ranked list of outputs and relatively small number. So the opportunity to be in a recommendation list is a relatively scarce commodity and uh, that can give rise to a vari various concerns. But one is that uh, our choices are dependent on each other. So if I recommend these five artists on my music app, then the rest of them aren't going to show up because I only have so much space, right? And so Making that decision in favor of, of artist A means that um, artist B may not be getting something. That doesn't show up in these other settings. Another important uh, thing, and this is what kind of distinguishes recommendation from, from many other problems that we study, is that the outcome quality is, subs is subjective. So what's a good music recommendation for me, which might be you know, jazz from the 1950s, might be a terrible music recommendation for, say, my, uh, my youngest child who only listens to hip hop. And so, <coughs> uh, and so whether it's a good recommendation or not varies a lot by the individual. And we don't want to say, oh, you can't listen to that. <laughs> That's not right, right? We want, we want people to be able to get the recommendations that they want. And that's quite different, as you can see, from, say, loan approval, you know, where, where really you want to have some objective criterion and it doesn't matter who's on the other side of it. 
Um, another thing that's characteristic of recommendation, not always, but very often, is that your interaction with the system is going to be repeated over time and over uh, various contexts. So um, I come back to Spotify regularly and get recommendations every day or really every hour, every five minutes. There's new news on, on Google News that I might be coming there to read. Um, you know, my Facebook feed is updating all the time. So <clears throat> I'm getting new recommendations all the time, and that actually means that um, uh, that can actually change how we think about fairness. Because it might be the case that what matters is not, like, is this list fair? But over time, is the system providing, uh, you know, fair results? Um, and that's, again, not something that we think about so much in the classification setting. Another thing that's um, important, and this is something we'll come back to again and again, so I want to probably uh, spend a fair amount of time emphasizing this, is the idea, whoops, of multiple stakeholders. Now this is true in any system, but it's particularly salient in recommendation, as we'll see. And so, and this is also true of information retrieval, um, and that's why our tutorial was presented at SIG-IR as well as at, at the Recommender Systems Conference. <clears throat> so I want to talk about this for a little bit. Um, in a recommender system, not always, but very often, um, there are individuals on both sides of the recommendation interaction whose concerns might matter. So if you think about, again, uh, music recommendation in the case of Spotify, sure, there are users, right? There are people who are listening to music. But there are also artists, right? There are people whose music is being recommended through the service. And, um, you know, if your music doesn't get recommended, um, people don't find out about it, that could be a big problem for you as, as an artist. Or alternatively, you know, if you're some, you know, relatively unknown artist and your music starts showing up on Spotify, you know, that could change your life, right? So that, so, um, so there's an important, you have an important stake in what the system is doing um, as a provider, okay? So I, I'm, we make this distinction between consumers, and that doesn't mean that you're buying something. It just means that you're consuming the recommendations. The recommendations are coming to you and you're looking at them and possibly acting on them. So when I say consumer, unfortunately it has that kind of like marketplace uh, uh, connotation, but that's not really what I'm talking about. It's like you're the one getting the recommendations. And then you have providers. So these are the people who they either have created or they somehow stand behind the things that are being recommended. Um, and so those are obvious stakeholders in the recommendation interaction. And <coughs> these um, kinds of concerns, there may be fairness concerns on each side. Right? You may have fairness concerns about um, you know, treating users fairly, but you might also have concerns about treating the item providers fairly. Um, and different, this is very, very application specific. Um, so, um, in the case, uh, we talked about uh, Spotify, for example. In the case of news recommendation, it's, you know, the, the stakeholders might be quite different. It might not be that, uh, you know, particular journalist who wrote the story, like you care about, maybe you do, but t typically you're not going to care about whether a particular journalist Um, so we can think about, again, we talked a little bit about uh, Spotify already. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of that in this case. So I just do know fairness I think about, well, am I going to be interested in getting different news recommendations? Is my kind of music represented in this service? Um, I remember it was a few years ago now when I first started using Spotify, their classical catalog was pretty weak. And it's like, I would get the same, you know, six classical tracks over and over again. I'm like, come on, there's more, you know, there's more classical music than just, you know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Um, but it's gotten enormously better. Um, but you might say at that time that my particular musical tastes were not being well served by that system, right? Whereas other users 
more interested in popular music, they were getting better service. And we talked about the provider concern. So let's talk a little bit about rental apartments. Okay, so, and here I'm going to ask for help from you all. What might be fairness concerns on the consumer side if I'm recommending rental apartments? So I go to uh, Zillow or a similar site and say, okay, I'm looking for a place to live. Um, and Zillow wanted to make sure that those recommendations were fair to the consumers of them. What might they, what, what kinds of things might arise there? Yeah? So you might care that, for example, and actually the people who might sue you uh, might care very much that um, you're not taking particular kinds of individuals and saying, oh, you, you should live over here and uh, not over here. All right? So the whole redlining, um, you know, uh, housing discrimination. Um, I lived for a long time in Chicago, so I know housing discrimination. Um, exactly. Right? So you might want to measure your system and see is it doing that, right? Is it providing the same level of service? And actually, is it even providing the same kinds of results for people who are similar um, otherwise, but maybe different based on some sensitive characteristic? Okay, what are some examples of provider concerns? Um, how, what you might want to look at to see if, you're, if the system was being fair towards, say, landlords, um, people who are owning apartments. So, <clears throat> ah, okay, so that's an excellent point. Um, and that's actually even more subtle than I was aiming for, but it's a good one. So, um, not every consumer is a good match for every provider, right? And, and as, as the, the uh, question illustrates, some, some users might actually be, you know, like objectively worse than others, right? So, I could recommend your apartment only to deadbeats, right? And then you would have all kinds of problems as a landlord. And other people, I could recommend their apartments to, you know, people with high credit scores and, and, uh, and they're much more likely to have a good experience from that, right? And so, and even more than that, it could be that there's issues of how well matched um, the opportunity is to the, per the individual it's recommended for. Um, so, um, if your apartment is on the fifth floor of a building with no elevator, I don't necessarily want to recommend it to uh, somebody, you know, that has mobility problems, for example. That would be a bad match for everybody. <coughs> if you think about book recommendation, you can see there's actually a host of different stakeholders beyond just what we might think of as, say, you know, consumers of recommendations, people who want to find books to read, and then what we might think of as the you know, creators or the authors who are writing those books. But there's lots of other stakeholders. Um, you might have uh, particular vendors, like if you go to um, sites that, uh, where you can buy used books, or even on Amazon these days, uh, you're not always buying from that company, you're buying from you know, uh, vendors that, that are there. And maybe a recommendation might favor one vendor over another. There's actually been a lot of controversy about that. Um, uh, books are published still, mostly, by publishers. And so recommending a particular book over another one is going to maybe favor one publisher, not another one. Um, and of course, these folks may have stockholders. And then, of course, we think about books. We think about kind of intellectual discourse in a society generally. Um, and, and therefore, uh, there might be a societal stake in, in recommending um, books, say, that are truthful as opposed to uh, books that are um, untruthful. We're not going to talk about most of those other stakeholders, but, um, but you can go a long way in this kind of analysis, which is clear. Okay, so, <coughs> so I, think, I hope you have the idea here of the consumer, the person who's getting the recommendations, if we want those recommendations to be fair, we might think about um, a couple of different dimensions. So one might be quality of service. So I alluded to this when I talked about classical music on Spotify, right? The classical music listener, and again, not true anymore, but in the old days, didn't get a good 
experience, whereas the pop music listener did. Okay, so different result relevance, different user satisfaction on different groups. Um, it could be that the resulting information is different. So that would be the redlining case where it's like, oh, people like you, I'm not going to give you these apartments, I'm going to give those to somebody else. Um, I'm getting different, uh, there was the case of, um, of Facebook. Facebook was uh, sued by the ACLU for giving job ads that were different between men and women. Um, lower paying job ads for women, higher paying jobs for men. So that's a case in which the person getting the recommendation is getting sort of different and, and uh, differentially better uh, recommendations. And then you may have issues where um, different kinds of users incur different kinds of costs to use your system and that can be something that makes it unfair. Particularly if uh, there are issues of privacy which might affect different kinds of individuals differently. There has been a long history of studying group recommendation in recommender systems. So um, let's say a bunch of people are going on a trip or all want to go to a movie. What do I recommend for this whole group? And um, in that kind of setting, uh, people have looked a lot at you know, what's fair to the members of that group. If I'm just going to give one recommendation, it has to satisfy everybody. Um, but usually that is really just looking at that first dimension and it's looking at it just within that particular group. Sure. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so you could imagine a system in which um, let's uh, let's let's think about this for a second. Let, uh, let's say a dating site, for example. Okay. So um, depending on your hmm, okay, uh, depending on 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 your particular interests or your you know your particular proclivities. Um, revealing who it is that you're interested in on a dating site, that might have uh, different kinds of pr privacy costs for different individuals. And so if, for example, um, the, the system requires you to say, uh, provide uh, you know, explicit ratings on multiple dimensions or things like that, um, that might actually matter, you know, you might, you might feel like that's more of a privacy invasion depending on who you are, right? So people with non-conventional uh, tastes might think that they don't want to have to reveal that information to use a system. So that's not so much like a rating thing, it's more of a user interaction thing. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> On the provider side, we might say that the fairness is going to be violated if there's some issue uh, that, that causes different content owners or, or providers to, to be treated differently. So maybe uh, they get different opportunities to be read or to be seen, um, different visibility in the system, uh, different cost of participation in terms of uh, what they have to do to promote themselves. And you, know, you can see those issues might be different across uh, publishers and authors. And then finally, I'm not going to talk about this so much, but I think it's worth uh, keeping in mind, is that there's a kind of um, fairness that has to do with how individuals are represented within the system. And for this, I think you can um, think of the well-known example. You know, you go to Google image search, you type in CEO, and you get a page that's all white men. It's a little bit better than that, but it's still mostly that. And <clears throat> so what that is doing in that case is actually um, not doing a good job of representing the uh, diversity of the real world, and that can show up in recommendation as well. So, for example, in news recommendation, it might be that uh, certain set, sets of issues representing certain uh, viewpoints or important topics to certain individuals just don't show up in your recommender system as news for people to read, and then people don't find out about those issues, and that can have consequences. Okay? Now, <coughs> um, in the recommender systems field, this kind of thing has been studied under the heading of diversity, it's like we want diverse recommendations, but um, but when we think about it in terms of fairness, we're actually thinking about it differently. So the diversity literature is all about how do we provide a diverse set because that's what users want, as opposed to a fairness concern, which is how do we provide a diverse set because that's going to be fair to the subjects of the, of the, uh, of the information. <coughs> 
in, and, and again, this is probably something that, that uh, you're uh, quite familiar with, this distinction between individual fairness, where we ask the question of how does an individual feel that the system treats them, as opposed to group fairness, um, where we're looking at uh, subpopulations within um, the overall, say, uh, consumer or provider population, and asking, you know, how does the system uh, treat those groups? Often, uh, those groups are defined relative to a, a protected class or, or sensitive characteristic. In this uh, tutorial here today, you know, this version of our software, we have a very simple idea of how this works, and we are uh, treating specifically group fairness and um, in, in a binary way, okay? And I appreciate that that's the, the most simplistic way to think about it, and the software is something we hope to evolve to handle more cases in the future. <coughs> okay, so with individual fairness, we say, well, we want all, each user to have comparable quality of service. That's kind of what recommender systems are optimized for anyway, although it, it points us towards the idea that the distribution matters as opposed to, say, just the mean of the results. Um, and um, it points us towards the idea that each provider should have say, an equal opportunity to be uh, recommended to users, um, might be conditioned on relevance. There might be various ways in which the, um, the audience's uh, perception of relevance can affect, um, can affect that. <coughs> in group fairness, we look at groups, as I said, and you ask, you know, is the system underserving certain groups in terms of uh, providers or consumers? In general, we're going to find that it's not quite enough to insist on individual fairness because any kind of measure we have of how uh, the matching against um, uh, individual results should work uh, could be skewed by um, historical uh, discrimination. So the classic example is standardized test scores. If I use those to predict something about a student, I'm building in the socioeconomic bias that that measure has. And so if I say, you know, two people with the same test score should have the same chance of getting in, I'm basically institutionalizing that bias in my recommender system. So it's not really quite enough to have individual fairness, and that's one reason why we concentrate on, um, on group fairness. Okay, so, um, and we will think specifically about these well-known ideas. So disparate treatment, uh, applying different standards to uh, individuals based on some sensitive characteristic. Uh, disparate impact, looking at the results that the system has for different groups. Um, and um, something you know, basically related to disparate treatment, disparate mistreatment, uh, differential error risks, for example, or error rates, for example, on different groups. All kinds of ways that you might think about fairness in this recommendation context. <coughs> so um, we might say, well, we want our outcomes to be independent of the protected feature given other aspects of the context. We may still run into this redlining problem because of the context. Um, we may uh, decide that we don't care about that and we just care about the outcome uh, and looking at, at um, at disparate impact. Would you make those kinds of well, that would be the case in which the if if from other aspects of the of the pro user profile, for example, I can infer that somebody is in a sensitive has a sensitive characteristic, then I may not need to use that characteristic itself. I can remove that characteristic from the system and still use the other data to come up with a discriminatory result, right? So if I know that um, the, um, well, and actually this is, a, this is exactly what um, uh, the you know, advertisers have done on Facebook, for example. They're not allowed to target people uh, based on their ethnicity, but they can target them based on bands that they like or uh, food that they like or things like that. And you put enough of those things together, you can figure out you know, what somebody's ethnicity is. Um, <clears throat> and I should say, uh, fairness towards protected groups is not the only kind that matters. 
I might care about the distribution generally of results in my system that I, I don't break the world into people for whom the system works well and people for whom the system works poorly. I may want to try and equalize uh, the benefits of the system for everybody, even if I don't, uh, am not, not looking at any particular sensitive characteristic. We're going to be talking about this because it's what's uh, implemented in the system. These other um, issues are also fairness concerns, too. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of definitions. There's a lot of ideas. Um, what do I need to implement in my system? I get this question all the time. And uh, the answer is always the same. It's like, I have no idea. <laughs> um, and that's really the hard work here, which is to say, you know, I've got a lot of these mathematical definitions. Some of them uh, we'll see in this tutorial today. Um, I can look at recommendation outcomes in different ways. I can look at different stakeholders on different sides of the interaction. Um, I can look at different, you know, ways that recommendations are presented. Um, and depending which way I look at it, I may see fairness or unfairness. So a lot hangs on how I measure how I, what I think uh, fairness means in a particular context. So, um, so the hard truth is that if you really want to do something in this realm, you really have to do some uh, sort of uh, the kind of um, study that will tell you what matters in my particular organization relative to its particular mission, what is fairness here, how can I take that idea of what fairness should be here, decide an, a metric that's going to tell me if that is happening in my system or not, and then I'll be able to be in a situation of trying to uh, improve uh, fairness. So. Um, analysis of the context, consensus building. Not everybody in your organization is going to have the same idea of what fairness might mean, even if that idea is there. And then the other thing, too, is that um, your, you may not al always appreciate all of, the, all of the fairness concerns that your system might impact. And so doing it just once and say, oh, I've solved that problem, that's probably not going to be enough. So. Uh, monitoring the system, listening to user feedback, you may suddenly realize, oh, those classical music listeners are not getting good results. Maybe we should, you know, invest more in our catalog or something. So, um, in some sense, trying to make your system more fair once you know what the metric is, um, what you, once you know what the concerns are and, and who has those concerns, that's the easy part. And it's like the hard part is really trying to figure out um, all the other infrastructure um, around the problem. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about the, when you have recommendations to the system, you should have that like explicit data or explicit data. Will that play a role in how we think about fairness? Because that's how the data is going to be explained. Only if you think there might be some systematic difference in, in and this is kind of the thing that I was talking about before. So if you think that some kinds of users might be less likely to give you explicit information, then you know, your data about them might be worse, noisier, sparsier, sparser than the data you have about users who are more likely to tell you explicitly what their ratings are. And, um, and so then implicit, if everybody's not aware of this distinction, um, you know, on, on Netflix, I can rate a movie. But Netflix can also see me watching the movie, right? How much of it do I watch? You know, do I get all the way through? Do I watch, you know, so, so they have an implicit behavioral indicator of whether I, I like the movie. Did I watch it six times, you know? Um, and so those two things are, you know, ex explicit, like provided by me, and also implicit. Generally, people generate a lot more implicit data about their interactions with things, um, and their explicit ratings don't always line up with their implicit ratings, right? So there's your guilty pleasures that you might not be willing to put the five stars on there, but you still listen to it every day, right? So, um, uh, so anyway, there may be some distinctions, but actually everything I'm talking about here can be applied to uh, implicit or explicit ratings, and all of the same concerns arise, except maybe for that issue of, of elicitation. But that's a good question, thank you. <coughs> Other questions? We're about to leave behind the topic of kind of philosophical, you know, what is fairness? And actually, could somebody give me a time check?
It is 145. Okay, thank you. I guess I'm not clear that of the distinction you're trying to oh, get at here. Uh, oh, oh, I, yes, I understand what you're saying. Okay, so this is a very important point, which is that um, when you're talking about personalization, right, you say, oh, is this, you know, is this the right thing for me? Um, Versus if you're saying, well, this job is objectively better than the other job, or this book is objectively better than, or this apartment is objectively better than another one. So um, I think in many cases where recommender systems have been applied in the past, um, you wouldn't necessarily want to assume any kind of, uh, you know, absolute distinction about people's tastes, right? You know, if you like Pitbull or you like Beethoven, fine. Okay, but there may be other cases where we would not want to say that, right? So, so there may be, uh, I think, cases like uh, credit card offers, for example, which are subjects of recommendation. Some of them have lousy terms, you know, and some of them have very favorable terms, right? And so, um, so that's a case where the, uh, there may be some absolute criteria you can apply. And then when you're talking about fairness, you can say something like, well, did this person get the lousy recommendations or did they get the good recommendations, right? And that's a, that's a different kind of measure. Um, but that does imply you have that kind of ranking or some way to evaluate the quality of the item in some user-independent way. I'm not going to talk about that in, in this work because we don't support that yet. Um, but, I, but that does definitely arise, yeah. Other questions? Philosophical part. Okay, there will be more chances. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So that's a, that's a great example, or that's a you know that's a good uh, place to follow up. So I'm going to use. So usually we're going to think about that in the context of the provider. Right, so provider, you know, consumers and providers are asymmetrical here because the consumer, they go to the system and get recommendations. The providers just have to wait <laughs> for somebody to come, you know, and hopefully their product might get, or their item might get recommended. So in the context of jobs, let's say you have a, a minority-owned business, for example, right? And so their jobs are in the system, um, and, the qu and the question might be, um, do, do those jobs get fairly recommended, you know, um, to the user base? Well, when a particular user arrives, um, it may be, like, it, let's say that's a, you know, it's a minority-owned business, it's an accounting firm. And the person who arrives, uh, their, um, you know, their expertise is in sales or in photography or something else, right? It's like, you're not going to, like, push the accounting firm job to them just because, you know, you're trying to uh, make sure that those, those jobs get recommended because they're not going to be interested in that, right? And so, um, so it may not matter that that list is fair if you can say that over time that, you know, the, the jobs from minority-owned firm get recommended the similar rate of jobs from other firms to the appropriate, you know, job seekers. And so, um, and so what you might want to look at is some particular time horizon and say, okay, let's look at a week at a time and say, over this week, what's the rate of recommendation of these kinds of items compared to other items? Um, and, and that's different than saying, oh, this list, you know, each list has to have this particular property. Uh-huh. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the, that, that happens as well in a site like LinkedIn, for example. Um, recruiters will say, who do you recommend that I interview? Right. And so, um, you know, again, you can decide if this applies or not in your particular context, but in the, in the context of um, a, you know, of a, of a list of, of job seekers being recommended, um, that might be a case where you would say, um, I actually think those, each of those lists should be diverse, as opposed to saying, well, it's okay if some of them are diverse and some of them are not. So that might be a case in which you wouldn't want to have that criterion. You may actually want each list itself to be diverse. So again, the, just because this distinction exists doesn't mean it's always going to apply. And you have to decide what's going to apply in your context and, and what isn't. Other questions? All right. So let's now talk. We're going, to, we're going to turn our talk now a little bit more to the technology, what we can do to start exploring some of these questions with um, recommender systems that we are interested in implementing or measuring their properties. So I first have to talk about LIBREC. It's uh, important because you know, that's the core that our, um, our tool is built on. So LIBREC is a open source Java library that implements um, recommender system experimentation. Um, I don't know how they do it, but like, as soon as somebody writes a paper with a new algorithm, you know, two weeks later it's there in, in uh, LIBREC. So, um, so you folks in um, Shenyang in China, I have to say that because if I just say Northeastern University, people think it's in Boston. Um, uh, so th this project has been going on for about five years. Um, and they've built this up um, to be uh, a very nice Java-based tool for, for this kind of work. Um, so there was the first demo in 2015. Um, we're going to be working with version 2.0, which is a couple years old, but they still haven't released version 3.0. Um, and when they do, we will, we will migrate to that. <coughs> so. And, and, and now let me take a little bit of a um, uh, methodological detour. How do we evaluate recommender systems? Now, the most obvious way you might do it is you might say, well, let's give people recommendations and see what they click on, okay? And of course, if you happen to own Netflix or Spotify, you're probably not here. But if you did, then you would have an easy way to solve this problem because you could just you know, try different algorithms you know, give them to different uh, user bases with A-B testing and see who clicks on what, okay? It's actually quite a bit more complicated than that, but you can do that. I don't own Netflix. And so um, as an academic researcher, we're usually in a situation of having to work with retrospective data that we're able to, uh, to get our hands on, and that means we have to, um, instead of present real recommendations to real users and seeing what they select, we look at what people did select and see if our algorithms could have predicted that. Now that generates a lot of challenges, uh, which I'm mostly not going to talk about. But for example, if the original recommender system was really biased in some way, you may not have good results for the items that it was biased against, right? It, you don't, people didn't click on those things because they were never presented with those things. Doesn't mean that they wouldn't have liked them if they did see them, okay? So there is a, uh, data collection bias inherent in a lot of this data. Um, and, um, you know, if you want to gift me a large internet company, then I would be happy to find other ways to evaluate my recommender system. <coughs> okay, so we're talking about offline retrospective evaluation. Yes? No, because that's a completely different kind of case, right? That's one in which you are... Um, uh, you are actually differentially presenting recommendation results to people and then evaluating what they click on. Sorry, I meant the, um, the, offline, case? the offline case. The offline case is where data is kind of available. It's data. Yeah, that's, it, that's precisely what it does. That's precisely okay. what, what it works on. Yeah. How do you handle the, the like, empty explorer type of uh, You can build that in if you, if you want to. It's not, it's not, um, Different algorithms hand, might handle that differently. Yeah. 
So yeah, that's an that's an algorithm side thing. It's not a it's not a platform thing. Okay, so then as would usually be an evaluation process, not mm -hmm. Most of them are sort of much more conventional things like precision and recall and calculated in a conventional way. <coughs> so the methodology basically says, here we have this retrospective data. We're going to divide it up into pieces. We're going to use um, uh, one piece at a time as something we're going to use to test with. The rest of the data we're going to use to train our model and then see how well we can predict the things that are in the test uh, data. So uh, conventional machine learning methodology. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about the training set of the data. Mm -hmm. um, is it just a way, is it like basic if, if you put like parts of the user profile and the whatever, whatever is provided in the response to the test set, if you are trying to generate a new data set, is this, so the algorithm is just figuring out how the user is based on that just doing it by correlation? You actually exactly want correlation linkage, right? That's, it's like, I mean, one of the challenges is, of course, there's time, right? So, so the, recommend, the real recommender system doesn't know how well you like Star Wars 6 when it's trying to recommend Star Wars 2 because it hadn't come out yet, right? And so um, if you give it the information out of order, you know, it's possible that it's easier to infer, you know, going backwards, right? Um, actually, that was a bad example because Star Wars 6 did come out before Star Wars 2. But anyway, um, <laughs> depends how you number them. Um, uh, so, uh, so yes. So th there is there is an issue of how do you you know how do you do the segmentation, um, and uh, what is your what's the training process? There are temporal ways to do that. You could say, okay, give me the first chunk temporally, and then use the second chunk. You know, so there. LIBRAC actually supports a variety of different evaluation methodologies. This is the most common one. It does have some of the problems that you indicate, but it's still the most common one. If I might just ask, what would happen if I, for example, put the user in and then just say, have a, a social type class, be the best of that. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that system just learn what the user type generated? Um, the challenge is that what do you do with the user who <coughs> doesn't appear in the training data? Right? How do I personalize for you if I've never seen you before? And so, um, now that's a real recommender system problem because new users show up every day, right? But, and so people work on that. It's called the cold start problem, right? How do you start with uh, users that are brand new to the system? Um, but unless you're explicitly studying that, you typically don't want the results to be contaminated with, with those problems. Because for those users, you have to do some kind of default thing. It's like, okay, the most popular stuff or, you know, something like that. So, um, so typically we want to concentrate on users. We know something about them and then we want to predict more. So this is a methodology we're going to talk about today. It's not the only one for folks who aren't uh, already well familiar with this. Um, and others are supported in LIBRAC, but, um, uh, not as well in LIBRAC Auto yet. Um, another thing that's important, and this is true for a lot of machine learning algorithms, is that um, they're very sensitive to the setting of different kinds of parameters, things like the learning rate, the number of factors that, uh, that are used for factorization, the way that regularization is applied to control um, overfitting and other properties of the algorithm. So um, there's no way as far as I know, to predict what the best values for those parameters are in any given setting. Um, that would be the holy grail of machine learning. Um, and so you often have to just try stuff. Yeah. Um, 
there is actually. So if you, if you talk to the people in, in industry, um, they're not going to do an A-B test unless on the retrospective data they see some benefit. Um, yeah, it's a sanity check. It's like, okay, if it's not better, then we better have some compelling reason to believe that the interactive setting is going to be different than the, than the offline setting before we're going to, you know, make the investment of, of, you know, even for some users, giving them lousy, you know, recommendations, right? So, um, so yes, I would say it's not necessarily that, you know, um, you would discard this kind of methodology if you had A-B testing available. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, methods out there. There's there's sort of, uh, there's searching through a scope of different parameters. There's um, black box Bayesian optimization for choosing the parameters, um, and that's not supported in in LibRep. Okay, so you basically anything you're going to do along those lines you have to do yourself. But uh, LibRock does have, you know, this active research team. It has a lot of algorithms implemented, a lot of different evaluation metrics, support for common methodologies. It's not incredibly slow, <laughs> which some other recommendation platforms are. Um, it's also not incredibly fast. Uh, so, you know, uh, welcome to Java, right? Um, and version 3.0 will have some uh, some nice advantages that we'll be able to take advantage of, say, uh, deep learning, for example, and uh, proper distributed computation. <coughs> but, as I said, it's not really designed for experimenters, for doing the kind of work that we found ourselves doing a lot in trying to develop new algorithms and uh, examine new data sets. Um, configuration is really hard. Um, the system doesn't do any kind of the, the data management that's needed to run these kinds of experiments day to day. Um, and it doesn't even, this, this kind of shocked me when I realized it, um, it doesn't even store um, intermediate evaluation results so you could see, you could like debug your algorithm. It's like, what did it recommend for this particular user? If, you've, uh, if you're doing sort of this kind of cross-validation study, it only keeps the most recent data. It's just like, what? Okay. So it clearly wasn't set up to do what we wanted it to do. It did its, the thing that it, that it was designed for, but not what we wanted it to do. <coughs> uh, on the configuration file point, this is a sample. The configuration files are much larger. You'll see some if you care to. Um, but this is what, there are sort of these key value sets. It's very easy to get something wrong. Um, and interestingly, um, from bitter personal experience, I know if you type the name of one of these keys wrong, it doesn't tell you that you did something wrong. <laughs> what it does is it draws the default value and uses that instead because that's the thing that matches the key. And then you're wondering, I said 50 factors, why are there only 10? Right? Or even if you can even figure that out. Right? So, so it's, it's very brittle and... Um, uh, many tears were shed discovering all of these uh, difficulties. And then also, um, just even understanding like what these parameters mean. There's some decisions that I would not have made um, about how these things are named. Like, for example, this is a property of the recommendation algorithm, but this is a property of how you're evaluating it, yet they seem to be in the same bucket. It's weird. Um, I'm not blaming them, but... Um, but I'm, I'm seeing the difficulties that there are in doing this uh, experimentation. So you could write your own recommendation framework. People do that all the time. Just type recommender, recommender systems evaluation framework into Google and you'll get all kinds of stuff. But we really wanted to take advantage of the existing infrastructure that somebody else wrote, particularly those 70 algorithms, which trust me, you don't want to have to write yourself. Um, and so our, so our solution was to put a user-friendly or at least experimenter-friendly wrapper around LibRec. We can use its capabilities, but have fewer tiers. <coughs> uh, any questions about, about this part, sort of the, the piece that we're building around? 
All right, so time? 2.05. 2.05, okay, so we have 25 more minutes. I think probably what's gonna happen is that we will not get to the installation bit. We'll just move that till after the break, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, so Librec Auto, this is, what, this is the star of the show, this is what you came here to see. Um, uh, so first we developed this internally. It's like, can we make it easier to use Librec? And then we thought, oh, maybe somebody else might want to use Librec too um, for these kinds of experimentation. So we, we kind of have slowly uh, made it more publicly available and this is more groups are using it. Masood's gonna use it in his class. Um, and, and so now, um, you know, we kind of, uh, uh, we're starting to t take it uh, to a public setting. In particular, we wanted to show off some of the fairness aware enhancements, hence the name of the tutorial, which is um, ways that we can now use uh, Librac um, to answer some of these questions about fairness aware algorithms, and metrics on different data sets, we can now use the tool to do a kind of experimentation that wasn't possible before. Um, Librec Auto supports re-ranking as of three hours ago, right? Um, some bugs at the last minute. Um, and uh, that, that's not part of the Librec model at all, okay? So that's something new. Um, and it's a very common fairness enhancement approach. And then we had to make some changes to Librec itself to, um, to allow for item and user features uh, that could be used in evaluation and um, in, in algorithms, okay? And we're planning many more enhancements. <coughs> so this is the old process, right? So you build your properties file, you, you run stuff, you look at the results, you're like, hmm, what could I have done differently? Why isn't it working? Uh, maybe you fix your algorithm. Maybe you try some, you know, try a different learning rate. See what happens. Okay. Um, and hopefully the data you needed didn't get clobbered when it moved its log files around. Now this is much, looks like it's much more complicated. It still has the Librec piece in here, but around it we have tools that just make your life easier as, a, as an experimenter. One is the ability to set up one configuration and run multiple experiments. So we call that a study. So you have a study and you do multiple experiments automatically. You set the server running, you go home, have dinner, wake up in the morning, and it's hopefully done. Um, some of those experiments really do take that long, even on big hardware. Um, it has this capability for re-ranking based on uh, algorithm results. And there's some nice post-processing that some of my students have been able to uh, develop. And you'll see the, see the fruits of that when you get to the, the live part. And so we can get different kinds of evaluations. It's not scrolling through log files. You can actually get some nice visualizations or other kinds of summaries that come out. <laughs> this is kind of hard to see, but you'll see real examples of configuration files in a little bit. Our configuration file format is in XML. And um, it gives you a uh, kind of more descriptive idea of what it is your experiments are doing and segmented into parts. So, you know, here's the metric, here's the algorithm, it's clear what each thing does. And then it, on the inside, it does the error prone work of translating that into the key value property stuff that it's so easy to get wrong. Um, so then each one of these becomes an experiment that's handed off to Librac and it, it does its own thing with those. So the XML configuration is way less error prone. Oh, question? Uh, yep, okay. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 could, you could do that. We haven't actually, uh, I haven't actually built the schema for it, uh, partly because it's still a little bit in, in uh, you know, under construction. Um, but the nice thing about that, as you, as you indicate, it's possible with XML to have an evaluation step where you can see, is your file well formed before you even go off and try and process it? So did you stick a number where it should be a value or something like that? Yeah. So, uh, and that of course is not possible here, um, except the kind of validation that happens when the whole thing crashes. 
Um, it supports hyperparameter search. Uh, we're going to add uh, Bayesian black box optimization soon. Uh, supports re-ranking, as I said. Manages the data. Um, it has multi-threaded execution, so if you're running on, on big hardware, you can run your experiments in parallel um, on multiple threads. You can do, oh, and this one was huge. I can't even tell you. Okay, so in the, in the bad old days, if you decided that you wanted a different metric to evaluate your algorithm with, which now we're, we're here, you had to do the whole thing over again. You're like, oh, I really want an N NDCG figure instead of a precision recall figure. And by the way, that experiment took 12 hours to run. And the paper's due in two hours, right? It's like, you're in trouble, okay? Been there. Okay, so the idea here is that actually evaluation is decoupled and it's possible to, to change your mind about the evaluation metric and not have to rerun the experiment. Oh my God, the hours saved. I can't even tell you. Okay, so that's a huge efficiency, maybe a little bit on the computing side and a lot on the human side. Um, and we get different kinds of outputs, as you'll see. Um, we have cool, although you won't see that today, Slack integration, so when you wake up in the morning, it tells you if your exam is in. <coughs> or in the middle of the day. Okay. Um, we are planning to, um, to actually rip out this piece, make it modular, to the, so, so that you could actually put an alg algorithm if implemented somewhere else. So maybe it's not implemented. Maybe it's implemented in you know, blazing fast C++ somewhere. But you want to make sure that all the other aspects of the evaluation methodology are the same, right? You, you, so you can just take out this piece, make that a subroutine call to your blazing fast C++ code, and you can be sure that when you evaluate it, you're evaluating it the same way you evaluate everything else. Um, so that's something we're, again, we're adding. Um, and as the Librec team does its thing and adds more uh, pieces, we'll be able to uh, build on those too. <coughs> okay, just a little bit of terminology. I mentioned this before. Um, when you create a configuration, you are creating a study. Um, inside of a study is multiple experiments uh, determined by different parameter values. And then, um, and then when you run Librex, you execute a particular experiment over a particular training and test data set. <coughs> this, uh, it's organized in uh, a folder hierarchy, so there's the study itself, there's a directory for the configuration information. Again, we'll take a look at all this when we run it. We have the data files. Usually, it, it doesn't have to be there in the study. It could be that you have one data set that you're using for multiple studies. For simplicity, in this tutorial, we've all put everything self-contained here. These are automatically created experiment folders that have their own structure because each one of these runs has its own uh, results, logs from execution, its own, in this case, the configuration is the properties file, that um, key value thing, this thing. <coughs> and then there's the result of post-processing operations, including visualizations that we'll see. Um, this stuff is automatically generated. <coughs> So any questions about the system? It is um, a command line tool. Okay, now that's, that's really a choice um, uh, dictated by the stage of development we're at. It involves you know, typing stuff in in the old fashioned way. Um, but the other benefit of that is that it really is easy to move it to a server, you know, run it uh, for a long running job, um, execute it in that way. Uh, whereas that's more difficult with other kinds of applications. Eventually, we'd like to, you know, make a more uh, glitzy front end, but uh, all of the capabilities are, you know, if, uh, they're more workhorse capabilities rather than user-friendly ones at this point. Okay, I think what I'm going to do, what time, what time are we at? 2.15. Okay. So um, rather than take, I mean, we could take, the, well, maybe we should, what should we do? Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demo a little bit. I'm going to just show you 
uh, what it does uh, and show you a little bit of the, um, the underlying uh, uh, files and so forth. Um, if you haven't installed these things, you, you, you might want to start doing that. If you have, you can, um, you can move on to actually installing the tool itself. This is the data that you'll need for the tutorial today, and then you'll be executing from within that. When we come back, we'll actually um, uh, start off with uh, making sure everybody who wants to can, can run the software. Okay, so uh, let's say a little bit about the configuration. Um, okay, so this is not my computer. My computer didn't like the projector. So anything can happen. Okay. All right. Is that visible? I'm going to make it bigger. Nope. <laughs> Is it zoom? Here we go. One more. My students are always complaining they can't read my code. Come on. There we go. All right. Okay. So this is what a configuration file looks like. Um, it has, uh, it, you know, it's divided into pieces. Some of it tells you where things are located, or tells Librec where things are located, uh, the files that it needs. Um, this tells you about the evaluation methodology, in this case, cross-validation. And then my, uh, my algorithm is here. In this case, it's biased matrix factorization. That doesn't mean that it's like biased against somebody or somebody else. This has to do with, you know, that's a, a machine learning concept of bias. Um, uh, the learning, you know, so, so aspects of how that particular uh, model um, uh, is parameterized. And key thing here, and this will be true uh, most of the time today, um, we're looking at two variants of this algorithm based on how they factorize uh, the ratings uh, that are provided, either 10 latent factors, sort of ways of, of uh, decomposing the preferences, or 20 latent factors, okay? And, and there's a trade-off, a standard trade-off uh, between uh, we can have more latent factors, uh, it takes longer to train, it's more numerically unstable, and so forth, uh, but if we have fewer, then we're basically compressing the data possibly too much, and so the accuracy goes down. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So, so um, you, yeah, you can go wild in terms of, of multiple values there. So we will try all the combinations. Of course, depends how much computer time you have. <laughs> um, and yeah. Oh yeah, so that's there. I maybe didn't highlight that, but that's up here. So the random speed, yeah. So you can make sure your results are reproducible. Um, and, yeah, okay, so we saw the algorithm, and, and then here, uh, information about the metric. Here are the, we're going to uh, measure using precision and recall. Again, there's like a dozen different metrics that are built in. And then this is a little bit of, um, uh, shows some of the ability to spawn a, uh, summarization script that actually takes the output and does something uh, with it. So that's a configuration file. Um, the study that we'll be looking at, we're using a subset of the movie lens data, well-known uh, movie lens one million data set. Um, that is not the right URL. I'll correct that. It's a break. Um, but uh, you have access to this data set because you'll download it from the, with the tutorial uh, check out. Um, some information about the number of users and items. Uh, the reason why we sampled it was um, because we were trying to um, uh, get certain values with respect to the consumer side attributes and the provider side attributes. 
Um, in the case of on the consumer side, because of the origin of the data, we have gender information for the users, so male and female, the binary attribute, and then um, there's various ways you might think about kind of provider fairness with respect to movies, but um, we're following a methodology that uh, Professor uh, Tamashima came up with, which um, divides the movies based on whether they are newer movies or older movies and, um, and treats that as a sensitive attribute. Okay. Uh, so ageism with respect to movies, something like that. Okay. And, um, and again, you know, the factorization method and uh, precision and recall. Um, okay, so that's the configuration file that we saw. Um, you can see that you can apply multiple metrics at once and the value elements uh, give you the different parameter settings. Okay, so again, how are we doing? Uh, so okay, so let's run it. Okay, so. so it takes a little while. Okay, so this tells me, asks me if I want to get rid of the old results. Sometimes I do want to do that, sometimes I don't. <coughs> um, most of the log information you can ignore. Um, this is the important output, so it, um, it actually creates some visualizations, uh, creates a little web page, and then through the magic of Python, uh, interacts with your web browsers to show it. Okay. So, um, remember we had two different cases, so, um, you know, uh, 10 factors, 20 factors. If I had picked different learning rates, it would have taken twice as long, so <laughs> that's why. Oh, the other thing I did want to say, I've done, or we, I should say, we have done nothing to optimize the settings here for the particular data, or very little, okay? So, um, you could probably get much better results by tinkering with that. And in particular, um, we have it uh, stop well before it reaches any kind of convergence on the machine learning, okay? So this is not meant to be like, ooh, you know, biased matrix factorization, this is how well it works. No. <laughs> so, uh, so this is lousy precision, right? So it's 5%, right? So it's, and it's a little bit better with more factors, but who knows what 50 factors would be like. Um, so that's the mean. This gives you a sense of the distribution over the different folds of the data. So you can see, you know, um, how dispersed the results are um, in the box plot. And this result gives you um, uh, the similar results for the recall. Now, this is really just meant to be an example because you can write your own script, however you want to summarize the data uh, from these kinds of experiments, and um, and and that's just a you know you have to this is just done in Matplotlib, um, and uh, you know with Python it's pretty easy to script new ways of of uh, interacting with it, and we have fairly um, general um, interfaces to the log data that's telling you about you know what these results are. And oh yeah, one other thing I wanted to show you. Okay, so that was example one. Okay, it created these two experiments. Okay, and this is experiment zero, so that's the ten factor one. It's got its own configuration, um, and you can see that's the, you know, that's the sort of old uh, library style uh, configuration, and um, all those parameters have ended up in there, but I didn't have to write it. And there's a similar one for the other experiment. And then in the post-processing here, we can see here's the, you know, here's the visualizations that were, that were output. So I think um, 
this is a good time. We'll go back here. Okay, so you're welcome to try this yourself. Um, if you've got the software installed, you can go ahead and see if you get the same results I did. Knock on wood with that. Um, uh, I think, so originally I guess I had the, um, uh, the browser, so that's part of the configuration. Yeah, my instructions don't match reality anymore. Um, you'll see the, this is set to true. If it's set to false, then it'll just create the images, but it won't put them up in your web browser. I suggested here, you know, changing that parameter to, to see. But in particular, um, if you did do that, you could just run post because you're only running the post processing part. You don't need to generate the results again or anything. You can just uh, rerun that. So if you do have the software, you can try that in the next five minutes. I don't want you to miss your coffee break. Um, if you don't, this would be a good time to like install the, the pieces of it. And uh, myself and our assistants will be here to, to help you uh, help you get that uh, working if you have any difficulty. So let's pick up where we left off. Um, in particular, is there anybody who wants to run the example and weren't able to? Um, ran into problems of one kind or another. We have multiple experts here who can, who can help you with that. All right, good. Um, all right, so for the second half, as some of you noticed, the, the first half was really fairly, you know, recommender systems generic. Now we're gonna get into the question of, you know, how to take uh, the methodologies that we've seen, these concepts that we've seen, and uh, make them more concrete. So we're gonna start off talking about metrics. So um, as, you know, as we kind of indicated, um, it's not necessarily a simple question to answer. You know, what does it mean for a recommendation result to be fair? And um, we are gonna talk now about recommendation results in terms of individual recommendation lists for the most part, um, uh, leaving aside the point that I raised earlier, which is you may actually wanna look at a larger scope than just a particular list when you're evaluating uh, fairness. That's a little bit of a open research problem in the field right now. Um, so again, I wanna emphasize that whatever the answer is to this, it's going to be very domain specific for your particular application, what fairness is gonna mean in your context, how you're gonna need to measure it. We are going to assume that the world is divided into the protected and unprotected group. We have some label, uh, either on the users or the items that tell us which group something is in. And the question we're trying to answer is, um, you know, is there some difference between the treatment of the protected group and the unprotected group in the way recommendations are generated? <clears throat> so that's not the only kind of fairness one might care about, but it's the place you would start. It's where a, a lot of research has concentrated up to now. Uh, not the protected group. So, <laughs> a pr uh, well, it, so yeah, it depends on what the protected group is. But if you say the protected group is um, females, then it's you know all the male users, right? So just whatever whatever your particular you know uh, group of interest is not. <laughs> Um, and, of, and of course, the world is more complicated than that, as we know. <coughs> so um, again, we're gonna, we're, it's gonna matter whether we care about the consumers of the recommendations or the providers of the items being recommended. So um, if we're interested in um, the consumer side of this question, then uh, there's two ways we can take it, and actually the question that was asked near the end of the last session is very pertinent here, because that asks about this second piece, which is uh, recommendation, uh, the quality of the items being recommended in some kind of general sense, are they better stuff, higher paying jobs, nicer apartments, um, uh, you know, whatever it is that makes something sort of in some absolute sense better in a particular domain, we might wanna care about differences between the two groups in terms of the good stuff that's out there. 
Um, that's, that's adds an additional level of kind of domain specificity in the sense that now I have to tell you what is that absolute thing that makes uh, one thing better than another. There aren't a lot of uh, data sets that we can use for that kind of study. Um, so that's in italics because we don't have anything along those lines yet. Um, I think that's a very interesting area of, of, uh, of research and uh, there's plenty to do there. But we don't have anything to show you today. We're concentrating on what we might think of as differential performance, differential accuracy of the system. If you are in the protected group, does the system work worse for you than it does for people in the unprotected group? Um, uh, in terms of uh, matching your interests, uh, having low error, et cetera. On the provider side, we can think about a recommender system as providing differential, possibly providing differential benefits for different providers. So um, does the system um, you know, show your products more often if you, or show your books more often if you're a male author than if you're a female author? for example. Um, you could also do a similar thing on this sort of quality side, right? So you could look at, um, you know, the, uh, whether the, um, you know, you get a better match in terms of the users that see your products, right? So maybe your products get recommended all the time, but they get recommended to people who aren't interested in them. And so, you know, the recommender system's not really working for you. That would be, um, um, and you could, you could even think about uh, specific, say, target groups or particular desirable demographics, et cetera. All of those kinds of absolute concerns might also enter into uh, the quality of recommendations. But mostly we're going to be looking at uh, these differential benefits in terms of exposure. Just, you know, are your products recommended um, uh, highly or well or often? as a provider. Okay, so these are the things that are implemented. Well, Masood can tell me if I'm lying or not. These are the things that are implemented in the current version of the system. And we're going to talk about what they are. Uh, there are more to come because this is definitely not a complete list of what one might care about. Um, so uh, a few on the consumer side, a few on the provider side. <coughs> Um, so let's talk about value unfairness. That idea comes from uh, this uh, well-known neuro IPS paper. And um, so what we're asking here is about error. So one thing you can do with a recommender system is deliver lists of recommendations. Another thing you can do is you can predict what the, how the user might have rated an item. So I might say, um, oh, um, you know, Professor Burke, welcome back to our system. We think you would really love to watch uh, Toy Story 5 or whatever they're up to now. And that might be a terrible recommendation because so it doesn't belong on the list, but it also might be a terrible recommendation because they say, we think you would rate this 4.8 and I would really rate it 2. Okay? So there's error associated with that prediction. So we can ask, does the recommender system systematically generate more error when it's trying to make predictions for one group or another group? And that error might be thought of in various ways. So, um, and, <coughs> uh, and the algorithm here is fairly uh, straightforward, um, although maybe you might imagine doing it in different ways. They did it in this particular way for this paper, and you'll see this a lot in the literature because they could turn it into an optimization objective more easily, okay? So the realm of machine learning is the realm of what you can turn into an optimization objective easily. Okay, so in this case what you do is you, um, you look at, for each item, um, if you have the protected group and the unprotected group, you say, um, you know, uh, let's, let's average our predictions for each group. Let's see what people actually, did people actually like that item in that group? Um, and then see what the difference is between those things. Did I do a good job of capturing that sort of average tendency of the group? And you can, um, you can formulate that in different ways. 
as a signed difference, as an absolute difference, um, and as um, uh, and depending on whether you might care only about um, under predicting or over predicting for a particular group. So there's basically four different variants on this metric, and Masood, do we have all do we have all four or just absolute uh, absolute difference? <laughs> no, so do we? It's the value unfairness. Do we only have absolute? I think it's. I think we only have absolute in there. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> it's um. They're not that different from each other. So it's it's one of those you know simple matter of programming things to to have more. I think uh, the absolute value is probably the most useful in the sense of that's most likely what you're going to care about is um, how much error there is, um, not which direction it is. Um, but anyway, all those are possible. Um, so that's one example of a provider side of a consumer side metric because you're asking um, what's the error relative to different groups of users. Yeah. Yes. So um, and so in in this paper, uh, what they do, what they propose is basically um, uh, regularization associated with matrix factorization where you try and minimize this error as well as um, you know, increase accuracy. So we'll talk a little bit more about algorithms um, in the next section of the, of the tutorial. Um, but you have to measure it before you can try and optimize for it, right? <coughs> um, another one that, that uh, people have talked about, and this term, of course, comes very commonly from um, the machine learning, fairness in machine learning literature, this idea of statistical parity. You can say, well, if we're given out loans, for example, do we say as yes as many times to the protected group as the unprotected group? Here we basically treat appearance in a recommendation list as the, as the plus one, as the reward, right? So if you show up in a recommendation list, that's, that's good, and so um, the um, <coughs> we can ask, this is a, this is a provider side thing, we can ask, um, you know, do the items from the protected providers show up as often as the items in, for the unprotected providers? So this compares the two groups, protected versus unprotected, and so if the value is low, it means that the protected group items are a minority in the recommendation lists as a whole, um, and if it's high, then you know, the situation is reversed. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, just showing up on the list might not be enough, um, and so this treats it as a binary thing. Um, and so um, we can bring in the notion of utility, and this is, there are actually various formulations of this. This is one of them. Um, <clears throat> the basic idea is that we are going to measure, we're going to look at a group of users, again, um, it could be consumers or providers, and we're going to ask how much utility do they get out of the system relative to the other groups in the system. In our case, because of our formulation, there's just two groups, so it makes this a simple calculation. Um, and we use the log here to basically provide a kind of uh, discount. Um, and of course, if you didn't do that, it would just sum to one all the time, and that's not a very interesting metric for anything. Okay. Um, because it's the log of a fraction, it's going to be negative. So this is a particularly non-intuitive metric to understand, um, but the closer it is to zero, the more, the, the less negative it is, the better. And you can see that here in my little example. So. Um, Let's say I have three groups and the recommendations are distributed equally across them. So one third, one third, one third. We take the log of that, it's about negative 0.5. And so the discounted proportional fairness is negative uh, 1.43. Now let's say the results are unequal, right? So one sixth, one sixth, two thirds. So the third group here is getting most of the utility in the system. Now the value is more negative. Okay, so that's less fair. And you can see kind of the function 
of the, of the log here is to um, uh, penalize the value more heavily for those low values, or those closer to zero fractions uh, become larger negative numbers, and so that causes the, uh, the, the uh, result to be more negative. Okay. Now you might ask, it's like, well, is one-third, one-third really the right outcome? Right? So you might have, let's say in the case of um, movies or something, maybe you have some small movie studio that only produces a couple movies a year, and then you have you know, 20th Century Fox, and they produce you know, hundreds of movies a year. Does it make sense for them to have the same participation in the, in, the, um, in the output? And the answer might be yes, depending on the situation, or it might be no. And if the answer is no, then what you would want to do is you would want to think of utility differently. You would want to say, maybe think about utility per catalog item, for example. Right? So do each of my movies or each of my books have the same chance of being recommended um, as some other uh, publishing house or movie studio, regardless of how many there are, right? So um, if I have, you know, if I have five books or if I have 5,000 books, each item, I can look at, say, the utility, say, per item and think, well, the utility per item should be good across all my different uh, groups, okay? So that would be just, all I'm changing there, I'm, I'm not changing this, this idea, I'm just going to change what, how I think of as a utility. Okay, so there's various options there, and um, part of the, again, that depends on what your notion of fairness is. Um, <coughs> I haven't told you what I meant by utility yet, okay, but obviously we need that to run this equation. Um, so what is utility? And uh, people have um, formulated this in, in various ways in recommender systems research. Um, so one idea, and this kind of comes from the way, the, the sort of evaluation methodology we talked about before. So think about how this evaluation methodology is, is going to work. I have a training set where I learn about a user's profile. I have some small number of, of items where I know what the user, li what the user likes among those items. Um, and then I'm going to produce a recommendation list. And one of the things I'm going to look at, or one of the things I could look at, is of those things that I know the user liked, where did they appear on the list? Okay. Now, if I do a good job of recommendation, the things that I know the user likes show up high on the list. Great. Right? If I don't do a good job of recommendation, they show up low on the list, towards the bottom, or maybe they're not on the list at all. Okay. So what that suggests is that from the user's point of view, the utility of the system can be captured by where those items appear in the recommendation list that's delivered to that user. Okay, we have measures for that. In particular, there are utility-based measures for that. Do I have a slide for this? I don't. Okay. So um, in a perfect world, I would have an equation here. I'm not sure how important that is. But, um, uh, but the most common way this is formulated is um, what's called uh, discounted cumulative gain, where you just assume that it's good to be on the list, but the closer you are to the top, the better, and there's some uh, decay, uh, some either quadratic or, or logarithmic decay in the value of being on the list depending on what your rank is. So the utility for me as a user is going to be the sum of, of the utilities of all those items that I could have gotten from the system based on where they appear in the recommendation list. And if I look at that across different groups, I could ask the question, well, does this group as a whole, looking at all their recommendation lists, get utility, have those, have their liked items appear high on the list or not? Okay, so that's the idea of discounted proportional fairness. On the consumer side, this utility is going to be framed in terms of the stuff that I like being on the list or not. Okay, so the system is working for me by providing me the things that I like. Okay. On the provider side, we just take that same idea, but we work it from the other angle. If I'm the provider, what I care about is my items being on people's lists, not being on the bottom of the list, being on the top of the list. That's utility for me. So I can look at all the recommendation lists and say, you know, are my movies on those lists? Are they at the top? Are they at the bottom? And, uh, and generate exactly the same kind of utility score 
add it up across all the items and uh, get, the, uh, get that score. Again, as I said before, maybe I want to normalize that by how many items I have, maybe I don't. Um, that's, that's a domain specific issue. Okay. <clears throat> and you could even articulate it more, um, and we talked about this a little bit before, maybe not every user is as valuable to every provider. Right? So um, uh, I worked for a little while in recommending educational opportunities, out of school time educational opportunities to students. And it might be that the students who live near you are better for you as a, you know, if you're a particular school or a particular club or something, you might value recommendations made to students near you more than ones that are across town and they're less likely to enroll because they're too far away, things like that. So <clears throat> it could be that the utility is not the same for being you know, number two on the list regardless of who that goes to, but that it actually, the utility varies depending on some maybe probability you can estimate that the user would be interested, something like that. Okay, so this is, uh, we'll see, this is one of the implementations. You'll see examples of this score. Um, you just have to appreciate that it doesn't have a really intuitive numerical interpretation, but it's capturing this idea of the equality across the board. Another very simple idea of um, fairness across providers, yeah? Uh, so if you have explicit rating data, the user is telling you, you know, for these items that are in the test set, these are the ones that they like. Um, if you have implicit data, it's a little bit more difficult, although sometimes there are measures you can see like if somebody clicks on something, how long did they spend on that page? Did they buy the item or did they just look at it? You know, there's, there's various ways to kind of uh, capture that intensity. A lot of times it just ends up being binary. You know, so the, you, know, you either, you know, clicked on the item or you liked that post or not. And then it's just a question of where those things show up on the list. <laughs> right. Um, in the, and, and that's this issue that was discussed earlier in terms of um, the, uh, you know, the bias that's present in the data. But um, if you're just comparing algorithms, then all the algorithms are confronted with that same bias. So, um, you know, you, c you can still uh, distinguish between the algorithms, even though you might recognize that maybe you're not really estimating the true utility, you know, correctly. So the question of item coverage, we're asking, you know, what percent of the catalog do we actually recommend? And it's interesting if you look at, um, there's been a, a, this, this has been studied in recommender systems for, for quite a while. Um, in a lot of recommendation algorithms, this number is shockingly low. Like, so the recommender system might only recommend 20% of the items that it actually has. Um, and that's a real problem actually for um, uh, for a lot of systems, um, uh, you know, I, I keep going back to Spotify because I've thought about it a lot, but um, you don't want to only recommend the top hits because then you're never going to rec recommend the new emerging artist that, you know, that um, people are going to, you know, that's going to be a star tomorrow. So, <clears throat> so this, is a, this is an important question. It's like how much of the stuff that I have is actually being uh, recommended. And it's a, it's not a, very precise measure because you could have 100% catalog coverage where, you know, 90% of the items only are recommended once <laughs> uh, to somebody. So it's kind of, it's not a very uh, subtle measure. But you know that if the item coverage is low, then you probably uh, have a problem. And um, so this, this is a, a simple thing to calculate, a simple thing to understand. Um, and. Uh, the low measure tells you a lot more than the high measure. Um, we've talked a little bit here about diversity. And um, diversity and fairness are not the same thing, partly because um, of just the, the normative question of like, what is it that I'm really trying to optimize? If, if my lists are diverse, it just means that they have different things in them. I could be recommending you know, the number one rap 
song, the number one pop song, the number one classical track, the number one jazz track. That's a really diverse list. But it's not going to give me good catalog coverage, right? Because these are all, you know, items maybe people know about those all already. Okay, so <coughs> um, uh, you might get lucky and have diverse lists that achieve fairness, but there's no guarantee of that. Okay. Um, but, um, but there are some kind of well-established metrics for studying diversity, and, uh, and those are in the system as well. So you have to assume that you have some similarity function, and what you do to study intralist diversity is you say, how similar is each pair? Okay, so if I have 10 items in my list, I have how many pairs? Who took the street math? Um, 10 items, how many pairs? Nicole, you took my class. <laughs> hmm? It's it, no, it's it, so it's each pair. So there's you know if you have ten items, there's there's yeah. So there's there's ten times nine pairs, but they're symmetric. So divide by two, so it's forty five, right? So so um, you know so you have forty five. Similarity terms here, um, that's this, the K, see it was right here, the, the K and K minus one divided by two. <laughs> um, and so that tells you kind of what the uh, overall similarity is of all the pairs in the list. Um, you uh, subtract from one because high similarity is bad. You want, you want diversity, so you want that value to be low. <coughs> um, and so, uh, so that's an evaluation metric. I can say, over all the lists, what does that diversity, that intralist diversity look like? It assumes we have this similarity measure. Okay, and so again, that's going to be something that may be uh, domain specific, how you count items as being similar to each other or not. <coughs> okay, so um, I will, yeah, we will look at first at the consumer side fairness. Are we here? Yes, okay, so this is example number two. <coughs> Again, you will see the lovely meaningless number scrawl. Um, and then uh, the result here. Okay, so <coughs> partly I'm doing this so you can kind of get a sense for what these typical metrics results might be like. So um, again, we have our two different uh, variants of the algorithm, and now we're looking at absolute unfairness. So what does that mean? Well, in this data set, I think I mentioned this up front, we have male and female users. The female users are the protected group. That actually doesn't matter for absolute unfairness because we're just comparing the two groups. But what this says is that the absolute unfairness is around 0.8. So we are, there's a difference between how the system, the, the kinds of error that the system generates when it's recommending um, movies to the female users versus the male users. That's actually a well-known property of the movie lens data set. And um, that error is higher for the female users, although this, this doesn't show you that. And um, the it's, it's around 0.8. So, you know, if you think about the rating scale, uh, if you're familiar with the movie lens data set, it's people star, explicit star rating. So they give a movie one star. Not many people do that. Two, because you don't watch movies that you know you're going to hate. Two stars, three stars, four stars, five stars. So this is almost a whole star. Like the system is on average almost a whole star wrong for the female users versus the male users. This doesn't tell you which direction. I just happen to know. No, no. So the recommendation model just looks at the user profiles in terms of what movies they've rated. There's no user information used by the recommender. Yeah, and that's a feature of the, the matrix factorization model that we're using. It's only looking at the ratings people provide. It's about twice as many, yeah, and that's a feature of this data set. Uh, well, it's normalized in the sense that 
um, you're looking at kind of the per item error. Um, and so there's fewer items because there's fewer, uh, you know, if you can only look at the items those users have rated. It's not normalized in the sense that, um, well, I'm not sure how else you would normalize it. Um, because you're looking at the experience of the particular group. Well, you, you, you don't need to here because you're, you, the average is really between the two groups. You're comparing the two groups. And so whatever you compute, for, even if the group was, even if it had one person in it, it would still have as much weight as all the male users. Um, so, because it's the between group comparison that you're making. Um, so that doesn't impact the result. Um, what does mean, though, is that because the male users are the majority, that does kind of push the system to recommend things, you know, the way that they would like, because of course you're optimizing for the least error, and that's the largest group, et cetera, right? So it's part of the, op it's a consequence of the optimization that that kind of thing happens, yeah. So, I mean, I guess, I guess that would be asking a kind of different question, which is sort of like um, uh, something about the sensitivity, right, of the, the sensitivity of the error to the number of individuals. Here we're, and, and that's an interesting question, of course. Um, here we're looking at kind of just the performance of the system rather than the sensitivity of the result, right? But that's a good, that's a good point. Um, and then, here is the utility-based measure, okay? And um, again, we get this, you know, negative value here. Um, with two groups, you know, the equal would be up here, so we see that it's not. Um, and it's kind of telling us the same story in that, here it's very hard to see the difference, but um, you can see that the, the fairness Right, the close to zero-ness, um, just like in the other one, it goes down, you get, you get worse error, here you get uh, lower utility. Okay, so they're both metrics are kind of telling us the same story, but in different terms. The first one was talking about scores, like how good am I at predicting scores? Not that great. How good am I at ranking? Um, in both cases, not that great, but um, the, um, this is the amount of utility going to each, uh, each user group, um, and it's, it goes down for the uh, female users when we, when we change the number of factors, just like the, um, the amount of error goes up when we change the number of factors. Now, that's an interesting question why that happens, right? So if you were gonna write a paper about this, which some people in this room might be doing, um, you would want to ask, well, what is it about this algorithm that when I add more factors, I actually get better results, but my, my unfairness increases in both these kinds of ways of measuring it. So what is it, what's going on inside the algorithm? And um, what is it about this uh, factorization model that the number of factors has this effect? Um, I will leave that as a question for the audience. I don't have an answer for that, maybe check back next year uh, for that. All right, so we'll go back to this, and now we're gonna look at the, uh, the metrics on the other side. So uh, example number three is the provider metrics. Um, in theory, I, I probably don't have to run this again because it's the same recommendation results. We're just measuring them in a different way. Um, and, um, uh, so, and so that the, there's that capability in Librec to 
um, just do the evaluation again rather than running the experiment again. So we could have done that here. I kind of kept all the examples separate so you can tinker with them separately, uh, maybe change the parameters of the algorithms and so forth. So, um, so anyway, just recognize I didn't necessarily have to do that. Okay, and now we're looking at statistical parity. Now in this case, um, uh, we're looking at the age of the movie. Was the movie an old movie or a new movie? Old movies have many more ratings in the system because more people know about them and uh, newer movies less. And so this is the fraction of new movies and you can see as we add more factors, we actually get more statistical parity. 100% would be there, the two groups are exactly the same. So here we recommend fewer than 25% of the new movies. Now it's a little bit more and that shows up here too. Um, the, and then here's the similar thing in terms of, um, of that uh, proportional utility based measure. And you can see actually, even though there's a difference here, you know, look at the weird outliers. This is a strange result. Probably not statistically significant when you look at it that way. So, uh, so you might say, well, um, maybe in terms of, uh, of being on the list, you know, it seems like we're getting fairer. But we look at this measure, we're like, hmm, the rank results aren't really helping us out. So maybe we're adding a few more of those, uh, those newer items, but they're low on the list and it's not really having a big impact on the, on the uh, fairness in utility-based terms. Um, and for some reason I put this here, although we saw this already, the uh, improved precision. Sometimes people frame this, I'll get to your question, okay? I just wanted to add this one thought because I meant to say it before and I, and I forgot and I'll probably forget again because I'm good at that. Um, sometimes this question, the, the question about uh, making uh, machine learning systems fair is phrased as this uh, question between trading off between accuracy and fairness. And, but that's not really the whole story. Like for example here, if we just look at statistical parity, I'm not saying we should, but if we just look at statistical parity, we see that actually uh, we have increased the precision and increased the uh, fairness at the same time. So um, it's not as quite a, as simple as, uh, as that. On the other hand, if I were to you know, squeeze every bit of optimization out of the algorithm here and make it as accurate as possible, it's probably the case that, um, you know, it, it may not be the case that I would have achieved the most fairness. There may be some other place uh, that along the curve where I would have get, gotten more fairness. Yeah. So I want to know also that uh, I would have a hard time in the question you were asking answering because I, it requires like a lot of knowledge to, to know what is really captivating and what is the, because Yes. I think that I think that's a great idea. I, I I mean I think here with statistical parity it's pretty obvious it's like one right. But with two groups I can't do logarithms in my head. But um, but with <laughs> with two groups it would be possible to put on here you know a, a label that says okay uh, this is what the perfect result would be you know one half for each. Or if you if you wanted it to be um, you know, whatever normalization you wanted, you could figure out what the optimal value was. Yeah, if somebody write that down. We'll put that on the on the feature list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> you're doing what? Um, I mean, yeah. So the, the the fact that it changes, okay, in the right direction, okay, that's good. But um, but you maybe want to know more than that. Like, how much better could I do? Yeah. 
Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon, I think. You know, I, I have, I've had this tension myself. Like, it's like, do I want to click on that thing? Because then that's going to be in my profile. And, you know, I, I made a mistake one time of um, clicking on um, a job ad in LinkedIn, which I thought was related to my area but wasn't. And then I was followed around by healthcare ads for like months afterwards. It's like, no, that was just a mistake, you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and I've actually uh, seen uh, like interviews with users where they talk about things like, you know, I'm never going to click on the NSYNC, you know, uh, song, you know, even because I listen to it, I just don't want Spotify to know about that and might show up and my friends can see it. You know, I mean, there's, there are all these interesting um, second order effects about, you know, collecting information about people and the ways in which it shows up. Um, but I don't think of those necessarily as fairness issues in the same way, um, except we did talk about, you know, sort of self-revelation as a, as a fairness concern. Um, I do think that um, people differ in, say, their interest in diverse items, let's say, or um, how much they care about, uh, you know, the, these, uh, the concerns that the system might have about fairness, you know, in different ways. And that's something that we have done some research on specifically. So um, there's this idea um, again, related to the sort of time course of being fair over time, you might identify certain recommendation opportunities as being better ones for promoting certain kinds of, of items than others. Right? So if I have a user who only listens to hip hop, then if I have some you know, struggling country artist or whatever that I want to promote, am I going to recommend it to him? Probably not. That's going to be a waste. Right? I'd rather recommend some less known rap artist or something. But if I have a, a user that listens to a wide variety of different kinds of music, then maybe sticking the, you know, the country guy in there is going to you know, generate some, some interest. So, um, the, so, so it, you can recognize you know, characteristics of user in, users in terms of their, their openness to you know, uh, to such diversity. And you can imagine a user even kind of self-identifying in that way um, to say, oh yeah, show me all kinds of good stuff, right? Or, uh, you know, show me only the things that I like, right? That's, and that's kind of a user interface question. I think there's a lot of interesting questions around that. Um, okay. Let's see. So we saw those two examples. Um, um, and you know, I, I think overall that sort of family of examples, there is like three for the consumer side, four for the provider side, but there's a lot of stuff we haven't covered. Um, so the ones that take match into account, like was this a good, if I'm, if I'm looking at provider utility, was it actually something that the user liked or was I recommending them something that they didn't like? Was that really good for the, the provider? Um, um, we can look at other ranking measures. So there's been a little bit of a cottage industry in coming up with um, fairness-aware ranking measures. So you can look at um, list prefixes. So like the out of 10, the one list, the two list, the top three, the top four, et cetera. Look at the properties of those lists. Does um, uh, do the different groups have equal propensity to show up in every uh, in every sublist? Right. So that's a that's a possible measure of fairness. You can look at pairwise measures. So this comes from ideas in um, economics about envy freeness. Okay. So um, would I rather be in my group or in your group? Part of that is I can think of that as like um, if items exchange places, right? Do, it, it are, can we identify um, uh, fairness in terms of the pairwise location of the items in different groups, right? So if one group's always at the top, then those pairs kind of always go in a particular way. Um, another uh, area where we've done some work 
is uh, the idea of, uh, of differential miscalibration, which is a mouthful, but uh, the idea of calibration is to look at what are the kinds of items that a person likes, those are the things that they've told you in their profile that they've clicked on or rated highly, versus the, the sort of um, distribution of items that you recommend to them. Okay, so if somebody has a wide range of music tastes and you just recommend them top 40 pop, um, you're not really serving them very well, right? And if that kind of problem happens across groups, that's kind of like this differential error, but it's a different kind of error where really what you're looking at is um, a difference in uh, distributions. So you can look at distributional differences with um, uh, callback Euler divergence or things like that where you are kind of trying to say, um, does the system really serve users in different groups to different degrees in terms of their interests? Okay, so that's this calibration idea. Um, and then finally, um, I've talked almost exclusively about a point estimate of an average, something like that. Okay, so in all these results, um, I did show you the box plot, so that gives you a little sense of the distribution, but you can turn those distributions into um, measures like Gini index, for example, and to say um, across all my users, am I serving some really well and many poorly, or am I, you know, it, it are more of the users in the middle? Um, and so you don't find that out from the average, but you can find that out from other measures taken over these error measures. Okay, so again, lots of interesting questions to ask about, um, about measuring what the recommender system is doing. Questions about this part before we move on to algorithms? Well, how are we doing on time? So we will march on to algorithms. Now, um, I want to want to say this is this is the this is the hardest piece because taking somebody else's algorithm and implementing it in a system is um, it's hard. And um, even if they've done a particularly good job of writing their paper, which is also not that common, it's hard. Um, and so the one example that we have in the system is the one that we wrote and we wrote a paper about because we had it already, okay? So this is an area where we, there's definitely a lot more work to do. And if you have your favorite fairness aware algorithm and you want to add it to Librac, then lots of people will be able to experiment with it and that's a big plus for you. Okay, lots of citations, right? <coughs> um, and then again, like this is, this is a important point uh, for here as well. We haven't really done the kinds of work you would want to do to tune the system for you know, a good trade-off between accuracy and fairness. Um, we are not, um, I, I'm actually deliberately making it run less well because to make it really optimized completely, it, it takes, and I did this, um, more than half an hour um, and your batteries would all run out. So, um, so the results are not necessarily you know, impressive or representative. Okay, but let's talk a little bit about uh, recommendation from an algorithmic point of view. Some of this might be familiar to you. Um, the basic concept of collaborative recommendation is that users have commonalities of tastes and those can be exploited to provide personalized results. What do I mean by that? Um, well, if there's individuals that like uh, similar things, then these two users, you know, share these books in common, maybe this book over here would be a good recommendation for this individual. If these users have this kind of pattern of interest here, maybe this recommendation would be a good, uh, uh, maybe this book would be a good recommendation for, for this individual. Okay, so you, uh, you assume the world is not random, that people's tastes kind of uh, come together, and that uh, peers are predictive. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the foundation of collaborative recommendation. There's a lot built on top of that infrastructure. So what we want to do is find similar peers, recommend their preferred items, and we're done. Right? Okay. So somehow that turned into 30 years of research. 
Um, we can turn the logic upside down, and we can say we have item, and items are similar to each other if they have, uh, if, if users, you know, if they're rated by users in common. And so um, a, a good recommendation is going to be one where I can find, um, you know, uh, where a user has rated other similar items based on this metric, I can find another one. Okay, so I can extrapolate from the rating. This is often more accurate and often more efficient than user-based uh, recommendation in spite of being upside down. <clears throat> okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the example, and I'm going to do that because I know that it's going to take a while, and if I waited till I was done talking, then we would have you know, some awkward silence while we waited for the thing to run. Okay, so this is example number four. Um, Very slow. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so there are a lot of elaborations of this idea. Like I said, many years of research on what you know. How do you handle this data about tier preferences in order to get the most information out of it? Every year, somehow people come up with more papers at the Rexis conference about what you might do with this idea. Um, and there's a lot of uh, math. Um, and you can include lots of other aspects of, of ratings and profiles to try and get more information about what you know. Time, item features, user characteristics, etc. <coughs> the basic idea, maybe the most well-established one along these lines, is what's called uh, matrix factorization. Again, some of you may have seen this before. And the basic idea is I assume that I can take the ratings things that I know, okay, so certain users like certain kinds of movies and not other kinds of movies, um, and decompose uh, that matrix into the product between two other matrices that capture what are called user factors and item factors. So this is the user's affiliation with history and romance versus the way we might associate uh, the movies with history and romance, and we see you know, Cleopatra is a little bit of both, whereas, you know, Pretty Woman, um, not particularly historical. Uh, Casablanca, you know, may, maybe make the argument that that's historical, but depends if you have to go all the way back to Roman times before you get to count it as, uh, as historical. Okay, so the world is kind of, the world of items is broken up like, like by these factors, and the world of users as well. So users have affinities to these factors, and I can sort of reproduce the original ratings with some error. You see the error here is all related to Cleopatra because she just doesn't fit in, you know, our categorization. Um, but um, I can sort of reproduce the matrix from uh, these factors. And so now I have actually a, a compressed kind of representation of people's interests. <coughs> and that's the sort of underlying uh, mathematical idea behind a matrix factorization. Now, of course, real ratings data is very sparse. So I would have uh, thousands of movies this way, maybe thousands, tens of thousands of, of users that way, and each user might have only rated, you know, 1% of the items or maybe less, okay, some small number. And so there's many, many missing pieces of information that makes generating these factors difficult. Um, and uh, I don't know how many factors there should be or what they might mean. Here I have cheated by telling you the semantics of the factors, but the system just knows that there's these correlations of ratings, and we might not have any way to sort of pick some genre or other sort of semantic idea of what they mean. Um, <coughs> models themselves have a kind of inductive bias. Like in here, for example, we're trying to minimize this reproduction error, um, but that's going to mean that if there are minority voices in there, um, if I pretend they don't exist, I might get better error than if I actually try and accommodate them. And so uh, just the, the way we derive the model might cause unfairness. Um, <coughs> so all those things are true, but uh, this is still the most heavily used kind of, of, uh, of recommendation algorithm. 
and well researched, um, and there's many you know many different variants in this ADR built into Libram. Okay, so um, that's you know recommender systems 101 in a nutshell. So <coughs> one way we could think about unfairness arising in uh, a, a recommender system, especially if you think about it in that kind of raw, uh, you know, neighborhood-based idea, if there's segregation. Like, you could imagine you might have, um, you know, like, all of the gray people, it's a little frightening, actually, the gray people, all of the gray people like the same kinds of books, um, then maybe they don't get any information from the other users and um, that could cause, you know, unfairness among, say, you know, the author, right? So, <coughs> um, so if your peers are biased, then those biases are passed on to you, um, and that can cause the populations to diverge in what, what's recommended to them. Um, so that suggests this idea of, of the balanced neighborhood. So, um, and we, our inspiration for that is from this uh, well-known learning share representations paper. So here, if you imagine, I'm making a recommendation um, for this user here, okay, the black square user, right? And, um, but all of the neighbors in this picture are other squares, right? And so, you know, there's gonna be a certain commonality there. Whereas in this, the, um, I have a couple circles in here, so that's kind of a more balanced neighborhood in terms of how I'm generating the recommendation. Um, and you can imagine doing that with items as well. <coughs> so, um, and so, you know, if we're interested in C fairness, we might want to balance neighborhoods across uh, users. If I'm interested in item-based fairness and provider fairness, then I may want to balance the, the item neighborhoods when I generate them. It's a hard optimization problem if you think about it in terms of, you know, creating a, a, a single balanced neighborhood for each item, you know, who's in, who's out, et cetera. So what we did instead, um, and I apologize for the math. There isn't a lot of math in this talk. Um, uh, we used what's called the sparse linear method. So um, SLIM for short, which turns that nearest neighbor problem into a regression problem. It basically says, how much should I rely on each item in generating a particular recommendation? And so I'm generating these weights as part of my machine learning problem, okay? And some, you know, items will be considered near with, with high weights and some will be considered far away with low weights. Okay, and that's an optimization problem we can solve with standard machine learning methods, um, although as we see, it takes a while. Um, then we can add our constraint, right? So we, we want this, we want this to happen. So how do we formalize that constraint? We can say, well, let's try and make sure that the, um, that the weights for the protected group and for the unprotected group are the similar in size. That means that the neighborhood kind of includes equal weight on both types of, of uh, items. And so we can put together a loss function and use the slim idea to, to uh, solve it. Um, and that's actually, we have that implemented in uh, Librec and let's see how it's doing. Slowly. Okay. So your laptop's even slower than mine, let's see. Um, but this is typical. So um, slim is really quite good. It's, uh, it's one of the best algorithms in terms of accuracy, but it's also very slow. Yeah. If I were the user and let's say that I want to change my mm -hmm. what I really need to then you're saying to me that yes, you could you have you use the value more than you have? Well, this is an item based algorithm. So the, the recommend it would it would actually say you rated these items highly. So that's actually a pretty compelling explanation, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, to a user. Um, the other one is actually, uh, and th there's been a fair amount of research on what kinds of explanations for recommendations, you know, people find acceptable. Um, and referring to other users is usually a pretty hard sell, right? Um, 
because it's like, well, I don't know these people, right? It's like, why should I trust what they say, right? And actually, what the system is doing is not relying on particular individuals anyway. You know, it's generalizing from the whole set. You know, you can't give somebody a, a PhD in computer science before you give them the explanation to the recommendation, right? Um, and unfortunately, you know, what we know from the research is that the most acceptable explanations are ones that don't have that much relation to how the recommendations were generated. So they might be persuasive, but they're not transparent. And uh, the challenge of being transparent when your model looks like that is hard, right? And so, I mean, this is, people at this, all week in this conference will be talking about this problem of, um, you know, how do you provide some insight into what the system is doing uh, without, you know, having to go into a lot of detail. Uh, so it's an interesting problem, and we don't get away from it, you know, uh, here. I think there's a particularly interesting challenge, um, and some people in this room are working on this too. Um, how do I explain uh, recommendations that have a fairness element to them, right? So, especially, you know, if you imagine the situation where there's this kind of, uh, you know, relevance and fairness trade-off. You know, I could say to you, well, I could have given you better job recommendations, but I had to do that PC thing, and so you're getting worse job recommendations, right? So that would not be very acceptable to most users. They're like, what? How come I didn't get the best jobs? What are you trying to do here? Okay, so that would be a good way to get a lot of user complaints, right? Um, on the other hand, you know, you might be able to give an explanation, you know, that's something like, when you sign up, it says something like, well, um, you know, our site promotes equal employment opportunity, and so that's taken into account when you generate, I, I don't know, you might be able to explain it in a way that people find acceptable. But the question of exactly how you can integrate explanation when, you know, there's these, uh, when there's sort of these multiple criteria, including fairness criteria, I think that's an interesting problem for recommendation that we don't have a lot of work on. <laughs> uh, I mean, thinking of your idea of what you said, like you have the iPhone to generate it. Mm -hmm. Because if, if the biggest question was, like, do we give control of the iPhone to the robot and we get recommendations and we get a chance to look at the user data in the iPhone, then you can go ahead. You can say, no, not that one. <laughs> So there, and, and there has been research along those lines. So there's, there's a lot of work on um, uh, kind of trying to visualize how the recommendations are generated and giving a little bit of user control with things like that. In user studies, they often find that, you know, 90% of users never touch those controls and never look at the visualization. So, um, uh, so that's a little bit disappointing if this is your area of research. But... Uh, the people that do use it actually find it really empowering often because it means that, you know, they can, uh, as you say, you know, get more control about what, you know, what the recommendations are, are delivered to them uh, at the cost of, you know, having to understand a little bit more about how the system works. So, um, uh, you know, there's, that's a whole line of research in recommended systems as well. Um, you know, I think with the issue of fairness, especially if it's provider-side fairness, do you want users to turn it off, right? Do you want the system, you know, users to insist on, I want my unfair system, you know? It's like, hmm, you know, that's an interesting challenge, I think, for us, you know, in terms of as system developers, um, you know, implementers. Um, uh, if part of the mission of the system is fairness, and there is a trade-off with other properties of the system that users might care about, you know, how do we actually make that acceptable? You know, um, and we don't have a lot of examples of systems like that, except evil ones, right? So we have plenty of evil examples, right? So there are systems that um, will, you know, uh, figure out how much you're willing to pay for that plane ticket and charge you that price as opposed to the lower price that gets charged to somebody else, right? So that's definitely not got my, you know, best interest in heart when it's, you know, producing those recommendations. Um, but, you know, that, that doesn't mean that's good, right? It's like, and, and actually the system is not going to explain it to you, right? If you say, ask for transparency, the system's not going to say, well, you know, 
we were mining your credit card data and we know you're rich, so you know, we're, we're not gonna give you the best deal. They're not gonna tell you that, right? So I think if we, if we care about here okay so um, so there's one one of these algorithms in the system I'm not proud of that that's just how it is um, there are lots of others out there and if you have one and you want to build it into Librec great um, but basically the same idea is pretty common so you you take your objective in this case it was balanced neighborhoods in other cases it might be things like you know, statistical parity or value unfairness or whatever it is, and then you try and create a recommender that has some kind of balance between an accuracy objective, however you formulate it, and uh, your fairness objective, um, you know, expressed in the same kind of mathematical vocabulary, and then you fit that function, you learn that, okay. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a variety of those kinds of uh, proposals out there. And one of the things that's frustrating, one of the reasons why we're doing this is because it's very hard. Hey, it finished. Okay. So, um, you know, you'll notice it doesn't have two, it doesn't have a bar plot and it doesn't have two bars because it only did one experiment because I didn't want to be here twice as long. Um, and, uh, and we can see like the precision is terrible, worse than it was before. Um, uh, again, not really tuned, but the payoff Perfect statistical parity. Okay, so um, we're able to get the old movies and the new movies recommended at the same rate by applying the algorithm. Um, and you can see what uh, p fairness looks like. More or less perfect. It's around. It's around two. Okay, so if you could do logarithms in your head, you wouldn't have known that already. Um, this is kind of is kind of sad, so we've traded off quite a bit of precision to get that. Doesn't mean it's the best uh, one could have done. Possibly you could have done better. Okay. That was well timed, because we're just done with this part and the algorithm finished. So I'm going to pretend I did that on purpose. All right, other questions about algorithms? How are we doing on time? All right, 20 minutes. We better keep going. Because I do want to talk about re-ranking, but I don't want to, okay, this, all right. <clears throat> so re-ranking is, um, it's kind of the first thing you might think of if you're in the situation of, you know, my, I have this recommendation algorithm, the results are not very good in terms of fairness, what can I do? Um, and uh, so one thing you might think of doing is like, well, let's just take the results that it produces, personalize to the user, so maybe they're pretty good, and let's just uh, move them around so that the, you know, we can uh, move some of the diverse items or the, un or the protected items closer to the top, because we know they're all kind of pretty good. Okay. So that's the idea of re-ranking, and it's been proposed for many, many kinds of purposes, um, originally for diversity. Um, so if you want to make the diversity of your list greater, you can produce a big list, maybe the top items aren't that diverse, but somewhere down there are, are more diverse items and you can promote them, okay? The nice thing about that is I don't have to write a new algorithm, right? And the re-ranking algorithms are considerably simpler than the ones that are, you know, doing the personalized learning and so forth. Okay. <clears throat> so we have a couple of, of uh, such algorithms. Um, these are both provider-side Fairness, yes. These are both enhancing provider-side fairness. Um, Re-ranking doesn't do so much on the consumer side because you've got the recommendations you've got, right? And so 
um, uh, re-ranking doesn't help you deliver different things to different people because it's, it's kind of too late. Um, so, and we have others that are on the way. Okay, so, yes? We're getting to it. Well, oh, so if you think, again, let's go back and think about the idea of consumer side fairness, right? So it's saying um, um, the, do, the, uh, do the recommendations that I deliver to a particular user, are they, um, are they differentially accurate? Like are they, is it more accurate for this group than for another group? Okay, so if the system already has that problem, I'm not going to be able to fix it by moving the items around, right? I guess I could make the results worse for the unprotected group, right? But that's probably not what I want to do, right? That would be like, uh, like um, adversarial re-ranking or something like that. It's like you probably don't want to do that. Um, uh, but, you know, the, it's like the, the accuracy problem is already there, right? And so I can't really fix that by moving the items around. Um, so... So mostly we're going to think about provider fairness. And this idea comes from uh, the, the XQuad algorithm, uh, which is an idea from information retrieval. And the idea in information retrieval for diversifying search results is this. Let's say I type in an ambiguous query. Okay. So I type in Jaguar. Okay. Now it could be I'm interested in fancy cars, or it could be that I'm interested in you know, preservation of the rainforest. Um, and, or uh, an old operating system from, uh, from Apple. Um, and so the idea is since I don't know what you actually are after, I'm going to try and make sure my search results have representatives of all those things in them. And so if I made the assumption that it was only about luxury cars, some people would be disappointed, right? So if I have a list that includes all of those aspects, then I can be... You know, I'm going to have covered uh, the possibility. Okay, so the basic idea is the search results should have at least one item from each of the uh, asp uh, the query aspects. Okay, and so what I do is I uh, I rescore all of the things that that I have in my list. I have a long list. Let's say I have a hundred things, but I'm only going to show you ten. So I have this big long list. I'm going to show you a subset of them. And then I compute a score, which is basically includes how relevant the item was, and then also is it related to these aspects that we haven't seen yet. And if it is, I'm going to promote it so that I make sure that all the aspects are accounted for. <coughs> okay, so in, um, in the FAR algorithm and, and its cousin, the personalized one, which I won't talk about as much, you basically treat the protected and unprotected groups as different aspects of the query. So you want to make sure that your result has at least one, that would be the simple version of it, has at least one protected item in it. Right? So you don't want to deliver any recommendation lists. I mean, you, you might not have any choice given what the original list is, but if, if possible, you want to promote the protected items into the recommendation list so that um, they're not all of the same type. And um, there's a proportional version of that where you don't give up when you've just placed one item in there, but you try and you know, achieve a better parity between the different kinds. And then the personalized fairness aware re-ranking uh, recognizes that some users are more tolerant of diversity than others. So some users might be okay with a diverse list and other users might be um, less interested in the protected class items. And so you can just, you can get a better, um, you can get better accuracy uh, with the same level of fairness if you are, attend to users' preferences in that way. Now, again, you might argue, well, maybe we should, you know, make those people eat their broccoli or whatever. But, um, but if, what, if what you're trying to do is, uh, is get better, you know, if you're trying to improve that trade-off, at least on paper anyway, um, then this is a way to do it. There are lots of other re-ranking ideas. So the um, maximum marginal relevance idea is an older idea than XQuad from information retrieval. Um, and there's some work uh, related to that. And there's a relatively new proposal 
um, uh, the, it's impossible to say, Fast. Uh, how am I supposed to say that? But it looks good as a paper title, um, and, uh, and, and basically it, it's, a, it's a re ranking technique that, um, that tries to um, preserve the expected number of items in each group as you go down the list. Okay. So it has a, it's basically using a ranking oriented fairness criterion like the discounted one that we, we saw already. Okay, so this is the last of the examples. It's also kind of slow. Um, and part of the reason is because what it's doing is going to generate the, exam the recommendations again. Um, what it's doing is um, every time, so it, it, it produces a big long list for each user. And then when it goes back through to do the re-ranking, it grabs items uh, from the list but it has to look and see, you know, how does adding this item to the list improve it? And so then it looks at all those items, says, oh, okay, I'll add this one, puts it in there, and then it does it again, right? Because it's looking at this pairwise criterion. So now it has to go through all the items again. So it's not, you know, it's not super computationally efficient for that reason. Um, and uh, I'm sure that our code could be improved as well. Um, that's actually a problem that a lot of these re-rankers have is because they are doing this greedy list-wise thing. Um, there's, um, it's, it, it's, it's just not very computationally efficient. So questions about re-ranking? Yeah, I know there's gonna, I should just ask you first. What questions, Marco, do you have this time? <laughs> Um, that's an interesting idea. I think as long as the, as long as the results are in the same uh, framework, you know, there's the same uh, uh, orga organization. So the output format um, for uh, recommendation results are basically user ID, item ID, score, but then it's a recommendation list, so it's ordered. So like the the most preferred item is at, is at the top. So you'd have user one, you know, the, the recommended list, you know, with scores all the way down, and then after you have ten or however many, then you get user two, and there, you know, so that's how the out, the results come. As long as it looks like that, then you would be able to use evaluation. You could use re-ranking those other pieces, yeah. Um, and that's a fairly, you know, that's a fairly basic kind of of output format. Um, one thing that I think would be useful for us would be to, um, to say, integrate this into a data file base the way it is, uh, the way it is right now. So anyway, um, yeah, theoretically you could, you could easily do that. Other thoughts? We have, I have a little bit more uh, wrap up to go, so we, my, my algorithm has a chance of finishing re-ranking before we're done. All right. Okay, so just a little bit uh, to wrap up here today. Um, fairness in recommendation is hard. And I, don't, I don't just say that because it's my research area and I want you to give me money, although I do want that, um, if you happen to have any uh, laying around. Um, it's hard to define fairness in, in recommendation. We've seen that it's very domain specific, there are a lot of different ways to formulate it. Um, so maybe it's too easy to define fairness, um, but too hard to decide you know, what actually applies in my particular application um, or to understand what are all the criteria that should go into that. Um, it's hard to get appropriate data. Um, it's not very compelling to talk about fairness in movie recommendation. You know, it's just like, who really cares? You know? But, um, I mean, maybe, you know, uh, actors and, and uh, directors care. A lot of other domains where we would like to be able to talk about um, fairness and recommendation, like job recommendation, housing, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really difficult to get useful data of the kinds that we would need in order to do this kinds of study 
um, in, and, and so that it just makes it difficult unless you're already uh, working for LinkedIn or something like that. Um, it's also very difficult to find a good balance because, or to find a win-win if, if such a thing is available. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of recommendation algorithms. There's a lot of different uh, uh, aspects of parameters to explore. And, um, and so um, coming up with a good solution is, is, uh, ch is challenging. And uh, you know, this is, I'm, I'm well acquainted with those challenges in doing this work. Um, but you know, the good news is that some of the hard work has been done for you already. I'm not going to say a lot of it. But some of the hard work has been done for you already. The folks who have implemented the existing algorithms, the metrics and so forth that we have, the ability to run experiments now with uh, relatively little, um, uh, you know, the l relatively little uh, file management and so forth, um, the ability to you know, share, say, configurations and so forth, and have a reproducible methodology. Um, that's what we did in, in creating Libric Auto, and I must say we did it for purely selfish reasons because we had to do this to do our work. But um, if you're interested in this kind of work, it's also available to you. Um, it will only get better with um, uh, support for deep learning and distributed uh, algorithms in uh, Libric 3.0. We'll benefit from those changes. Um, there are some things that we don't have support for, and it's hard to see that. Uh, the um, technique would really be good for it, just in terms of what Librex supports and uh, the evaluation methodology. And that is a kind of reinforcement learning um, uh, paradigms of recommendation where uh, basically you're having this continuous interaction between the evolution of the model and uh, the recommendations that are being delivered. You can kind of simulate that with retrospective data. I have my doubts about how good that is. Um, but in any case, it would be a it would be a hard lift to retrofit, uh, you know, Librec to work under those circumstances. So, um, so if that's your kind of algorithm, then probably you need a different tool. But there are other tools that people have created. Um, this is very early in this project, as as you can probably tell, um, and so this is the first time we've. Uh, offered uh, this tool to people outside of our, our research group. Um, and uh, probably you will discover things that uh, we didn't account for when we put together uh, the tutorial. So apologies for that. But then you know, if you can give us uh, your feedback, we'll be in continuously in the process of making it better. So uh, and we welcome contributions, ideas, uh, your uh, logs for when it crashes and so forth. And um, so happy to hear any final thoughts and questions and also wanted to thank you from all of our uh, authors and organizers. Food is back there and long distance wave to Nassim who is trapped on the other side of the U.S. border. All right, thank you. <laughs>